the worship leader, and I want to invite you to please stand as we begin with Glorious God. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. What you sing this morning? You poured out the water, raised up the mountains, imagine the heavens. I can't even fathom how good you are. How good you are. With one single motion, you wrote every word, song composed by emotions. I can't even fathom. Good morning. 
Um, my name is Clint Jackson. I'm the student pastor here at Highland, and I'm so excited to see all of you uh, here this morning worshiping with us. I'm excited for those of you who are watching online, either via YouTube or Facebook or whatever venue that you're watching. I'm, I thank you for joining us uh, in worship today. I love the song that we just sang. Everything about it is so true, but there's one part in particular that talks about how we are joining the stars in celebration of who God is. That is what we are created to do. We are created to give God glory. We are created to worship and to praise and give him all adoration. And that is why we wake up in the morning. That is why we go through our day. And that is why we join together in worship, either together physically or together virtually. So thank you for joining with us today. Um, Again, I'm excited that you're here to worship. If you are a visitor here, especially if you are new, either here physically or here virtually, there's a number that you can see on the screen. I encourage you to text the letters HBC to it. What that does is it gives you a chance to fill out a, a little questionnaire so that we can have some information about you, not so that we can abuse it in any way, but just so that we can fill you in on certain ministry opportunities that we have here at Highland so that we can keep you informed in everything that is going on, especially over the next month or two, hopefully, as we get, continue to be able to gather more and more physically, you will be informed of that as it takes place. Again, I just want to say welcome. I want to say how excited we are here today. And, and for those of you who've been waiting, what, seven, eight, nine months to join back together, um, I know that you are so excited and we, we celebrate with you. Um, again, ju just so excited. If you would allow me to do so, I would love to pray over each of us as we continue to worship together. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you and we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love and for your compassion and so many other characteristics that we can continue on forever listing off. Lord, we thank you for the fact that your love endures forever. We thank you for the fact that in spite of our inadequacies, in spite of our failures and how very often we fall short, you are still good. You are still more than enough. Lord, I pray this morning that our worship would be sincere, our worship in song, our worship in prayer, our worship through the opening and studying of your word. Lord, I pray that everything that is said Everything that is done, every thought that takes place will be edifying and glorifying to you. Lord, we love you, and it's in your, niece, your sweet name that we pray. Amen. Hey, guys. Happy Sunday. I hope you're having a fantastic Sunday so far. If you don't know who I am, my name is Miss Libby, and I'm the interim children's minister here at Highland Baptist Church. Now, I have a special verse for y'all today. This is Psalm chapter 119, verse 105. It says this, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Let me read that verse again. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So what it means in this verse by your word is God's word, right? God tells us what he wants us to do, right? And whenever it says lamp, it reminds me of a little light like this. So this light, if this room was completely dark, this light would tell me how to get around, right? It would lead me where it needed me to go. So the same thing with God, whenever God tells us to go somewhere, whenever God is directing us on a place that we need to go, we need to trust him and follow him like we follow a light, okay? So let me pray for us. Hey God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all that you bless us with. God, I pray that you just help us to understand that your word is a light for our path, God. God, I pray that we just trust you to guide our every step so that we can end up in the place that you want us to be, God. God, I pray that um, we just go throughout the rest of this day and that we glorify you with everything that we do. In your name I pray. Amen.
Let's continue that prayer as, they, as our worship team goes down. Pray with me. Lord, we do ask you and come before you and ask that your spirit would have complete freedom in this place this morning. Father, that you would, by your spirit, breathe onto us and in us, God. And that you would, as your word does its work, God, that you would cleanse every part of our heart that is not in line with the Lord Jesus Christ. God, if there's any rooms in our heart that have been uh, closed off for some time or uh, for a long time, God, from the work of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would remove those areas and, God, that we would give you the keys to those parts, Lord. And that you would do the work that only you can do so that you could get credit and that our lives would reflect and glorify your sanctifying work in us. God, we ask you that you would humble the sinner through the preaching of your word this morning. That you would exalt the Savior through the preaching of your word this morning. And that you would promote lives of holiness in your people through the preaching of your word this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that you have uh, placed in it to change us from the inside out. So we give you our hearts, our minds, our wills, our ears, and our eyes this morning. Do with it as you want, Lord. And so we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. All right. Uh, the last ones, uh, we've saved the best for last. I'm just kidding, groups one through three. Um, I do love seeing group four here. Um, it is wonderful to see all of you. Today, I want us to look at the ninth most popular psalm. We're in uh, week number two of our series called Top Ten. Looking at the top ten psalms. These are not my top ten. These are uh, top ten based off of Google because what do we do when we don't know something? We Google it, right? So according to 2014 survey of Google, what are the top ten psalms? Uh, this is number nine. Number nine is, as you can see, Psalm 119. Don't gasp. You know, uh, you, that may be all that you know about Psalm 119. That's good. We're going to learn some more today about it. Another thing that you need to know about Psalm, one, Psalm 119 is a psalm. That means that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and, uh, and in this psalm there are 176 verses. There's 22 sections of eight-line stanzas, and each strophe, that's the beginning of that first stanza in that section, begins with its corresponding Hebrew letter. So it just goes through the Hebrew alphabet like that. They did that because, think about this, kids, this is for memorization, <laughs> Memorization helps, this acrostic helps them memorize the Bible. And the longest chapter in the Bible is devoted to one thing and one thing alone, the value of obeying God's Word. We don't know who wrote it. It's anonymous. It has no uh, uh, author here. Uh, but what we do know is that as you read the psalm, uh, you see that this psalmist was dealing with problems or problematic people, kind of like we talked about last week. They're dealing with persecution. And the only thing that this person knew to do was to run to his refuge, to run to his strength. And that was found in the Word of God. And that's the value that we see in it today, is that when problems are arising around us, when we don't know what else to do, when everything is crashing in around you, when you're confused, when you don't know what decision do I need to make that's looming on the horizon, we find refuge and strength by going to God's Word. And it's not just about going to God's Word. There's a second component to this, that the psalmist, as he's writing this, yes, it is about the value of knowing God's Word, but it's more than just knowing God's Word. Out of 176 verses, only five are not devoted to uh, uh, specifically the value of obeying God's Word. See, it's not just enough to know God's Word. God wants us to know it and to actually obey it. In fact, as we look at this, what we're going to see is that our love for the Lord is measured by our obedience to the Lord. Now, our love for the Lord, biblically speaking, is measured by our obedience to the Lord. We hear a lot of people say a lot of things about loving the Lord, right? I mean, I love the Lord, but, and then they blast somebody on Facebook. 
Or I love the Lord, but, and then they say something so off the wall, counter to the gospel, whether it's on social media or in person, that you're thinking, do you really? Or I love the Lord, but look at the totality of the decisions that they make in their life. And we don't have to look out there. We see it inside of our own life as well. I love the Lord, but man, why do I keep messing up doing these things? Are you tired of messing up? Are you tired of getting things wrong sometimes? Are you tired of not making the right decisions? Well, guess what? You're in the same boat as I am many times. How do we do that? Well, how do we make these good decisions? How do we live wise lives in this world? That's the question that we're going to answer today is how do we follow Christ or how as Christ followers uh, do we grow in our love and obedience to the Lord Jesus? How, how is it that we can grow in our love and obedience to the Lord Jesus? I want you to look at starting in verse 1. We're only going to look at the first section, uh, verses 1 through 8, and follow along with me as I start there. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn of your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. So in this psalm, or this first part, the psalmist is going to point us to three action steps. Three things that need to be uh, prevalent in our life if we're going to see our love and obedience grow toward the Lord. So let's look at uh, number one, the action step, the first thing that must change, and it's found in verses one through three, is that we have to have a proper motivation when it comes to viewing God's word and what it's here for. A proper motivation. Look at verses one through three with me. He says, blessed are those whose way is blameless. The word blessed there is the word happy. Happy are those whose way is blameless. The word way, that means the way that we live life, the, the walk, our daily walk in life. And that's one of the words that the psalmist uses all throughout Psalm 176 or 119. And it's this idea of the blessed or happy is the person who lives a godly life of integrity. Or as Matthew Henry wrote on this verse in his commentary, godly people are happy people. <laughs> That's pretty succinct, but very true. Because some of the people that I know that are the most godly are also the most happy. They, they have a good sunny disposition most of the time, generally speaking. But the opposite is just as true, don't you think? Is that some of the most unhappy people are the people who, yes, they probably are saved, but they're not living the life that God has for them to live. And so they just remain unhappy a lot of times. Well, the psalmist is going to show us in these three verses that there's three characteristics of these happy Christians that he's talking about. In verse 2, he says that blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. They seek to know the Lord more intimately. They're seeking him with their whole heart. The, the whole reason they want to get up on most days is so that they can't wait to get into God's word and to see what God has to say so that they can grow and deepen their relationship with the Lord. So they seek to know the Lord more intimately. In verse 3, he says that who also do no wrong but walk in his way, that walk in his ways, they're ordering their life, they're structuring their life based on what God's word says. When, when they read that God says, love your neighbor, they're going to structure their life on how do I love my neighbor? When, when, they, when the God's word says, stay away from so-and-so, they're going to stay away. They're going to, okay, so where do I not need to go? Where, where are the influences that I need to, to put at bay to keep that from coming into my purview? These are people who structure their life according to the way God says to live. They, they live that way. And, or, and, and they also walk in integrity. They stay away from sin. It's pollution. These people, uh, as one commentator said, they're, they're as genuinely good as they actually seem to be. Now, this doesn't mean they're perfect. Uh, and he, when he says, who do no wrong, this doesn't mean that uh, they're, they're perfect. It just means they're not caught up in going back to the same mud hole over and over and over. When they sin, they realize it, they acknowledge it, they repent, they trust the Lord, and they move forward in God's grace. So they're, they're not perfect, but, but the, the issue here is <clears throat> what they've done is they've understood the proper motivation. Now, yes, the proper motivation or the overall motivation would be to glorify God in all that we say and do and think, and that is our ultimate aim. 
But there's a motivation that's underlying here of what they've understood, and the whole psalm is based on. Here it is. God's word is not there to harm you, but to help you. God's word is not there to harm us, but to help us. The whole reason God uh, tells us to, to do the things that he tells us to do, to stay away from the things that he tells us to stay away from, is not to keep us from good, it's to keep us good in a way, okay? And you see that in Adam and Eve. At the very beginning, he said, don't touch the fruit. If you do, you're going to die. He didn't tell them that to him from something that was good. He told them to keep them, told them that to keep them good. The same way as for us. We don't, God says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal. Those are things that we need to take seriously because there are things that keep us from hurting ourselves, from hurting one another. I mean, think about the times that, that you and I have messed up because we did not listen to God's word and we did what we wanted to do. How much pain and shame and anguish would you have saved yourself from if you would have just listened? to God. We've all been there. In fact, uh, I remember uh, one time I got it right. Uh, don't always get it right, but there was one time I got it right. In, in 10th grade, uh, I went to Clarkdale, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I remember it was after fall football game, um, and uh, it w after the game, one of my buddies came up and said, hey, uh, we're going to, a bunch of us are going to go camp out. Now, that's Clarkdale, camping out. I, automatically, I knew these guys from fifth grade on up. I knew what that meant. And I also knew what, what that meant was not something that my, my Lord nor my parents would approve of. So I said, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I'm going to go home. So I went home, had a, you know, whatever I did that weekend, came back on Monday only to find out that all my buddies had been riding around at 3 a.m. in Clark County, a dry county at that time, with two coolers full of alcohol in the back of their truck um, as 10th graders. So what do you think happened? All of them were arrested. All of them uh, hauled down to uh, the, the jail, and all of them had to call their parents uh, at the middle of the night. Now, some of you are thinking, well, what's the big deal with that? That's just country life, right? That's, the, that's just boys being boys. Well, other than the fact that it's illegal, think about how much that would have destroyed my gospel witness to these guys if I would have just been there just in, uh, just in person, just in assimilation with them. By God's grace, thankfully, I listened to God's word, and it saved me from a future regret. And God's word will always, and I mean always, lead you and me in the right way and in the right path. Psalm 119 verse 9, how can a young man or young person keep their way pure? By living according to your word. Verse 11, your word have I hid in my heart or stored up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 37 of the same chapter, turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things. TV, social media, I mean, all these things, they're just, they're just giving us images of worthless things. I got to have this. I got to have that. I need to work for this. I got to do this. Look, the psalmist knew all that without even having all that. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life according to your word. Or in verse 105 that we all know, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light unto my path. If we want to grow in our love and obedience to the Lord, we have a proper motivation. God's word is there to help us, not harm us. Ultimately, it points us to the one who has helped us the most, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the Bible it's either pointing to him or live life from him. So all of it points to him. And then the second reason or the second thing that needs to change in our life maybe would be to cultivate a heart of obedience. To cultivate a heart of obedience. Look at verses 4 through 6. He says, you, commanded, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all of your commandments. Now, notice the switch in pronouns here. He goes from talking in verses 1 through 3, talking about the Lord, and now he switches to talking to the Lord. Obedience is a personal matter, and you and I have to be personally involved, okay? It, it, God's not going to do it for you, and he's not going to do it for me, nor can we do it without him. Obedience is a mutual cooperation between the Lord and his kid. That's how this works. And we see this in verses four through six. Look at the first one. In verse four, we see that we have a responsibility to obey as a follower of Christ. 
You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. God expects all of his commands to be obeyed. Not just some of the ones that we agree with. Not just the ones that are easier for us than others. Not just the ones that may benefit us personally. God expects all of his commands to be obeyed. Again, Adam and Eve, this was the problem in the garden. They thought, well, maybe God doesn't expect all of them to be obeyed, um, so we'll just disobey this one. Well, that mattered because we're living results of that, right? So one command does matter. But you know, as well as I do, that uh, we mess up and we're not perfect. Uh, we won't be perfect on this side of eternity. So what do we do? No matter how hard, we're, how hard we try, we can't do it on our own. So what do we do? Well, look at the next part. We also should exercise wisdom in asking God for help. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. This is a specific prayer of the psalmist here. The statute there is a prescribed boundary. It's like the guardrails on a winding mountain road. If you stay within those guardrails in your lane, um, well, things typically work out pretty good for you. If you go outside of the lane, outside of the guardrails, there's danger out there. And so he understands he wants to obey, but he also knows his heart will easily lead him astray and lead him into things that are dangerous. And he understands that he needs supernatural assistance to live within God's boundary in the way that God has uh, designed for us to live. And in fact, if you'll look down at verse 8, at the bottom of verse 8, this is the, the, the second part of really verse 5 where he says, Do not utterly forsake me, Lord. Do not utterly forsake me. What he means is, Lord, don't let me have to walk this road alone. And praise God, we don't have to if we don't want to because God is there to help every single time. See how this works is when we read God's word and we begin to put that into practice and we try to choose what is right in the moment as best as we see that it fits God's word. But you know what? Sometimes we get that wrong. And so we ask God, God help me. And God will begin to redirect our thoughts, redirect our hearts, redirect our passions where they need to be that are in more line with him. But they're not gonna be in line with him if we're not asking him to do that. And so we want to cultivate this heart. But there's also this serious business of, of, of obedience here in verse 6. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. There are some Christians that, that pick and choose. They want to pick and choose which commands to obey and which ones not to obey. And if you do that, you're setting yourself up for shame at some point down the road. But the person who honors and obeys all of God's commands, the prohibitions as well as the precepts, that person, according to the psalm, is going to be blessed. A couple of weeks ago, Evan and I took this uh, crazy day trip up to uh, Missouri, there and back in one day, a lot of driving. But as we went, uh, we got there. I had not been to Missouri in a while, and, and um, I, we passed over into Missouri, and there's all this farmland there. It's just roll, I mean, the hill, not roll. It's, yeah, it's uh, uh, farmland after farmland after farmland and all these crops of uh, wheat and corn and all this stuff out there. And, and also with all the crops are all the huge tractors, um, the combines working. And, and, what, and they were working when we went through early that morning. They were working when we came back late that afternoon. They were constantly working. What they were doing were what? They were cultivating the crop. They were cultivating the soil. Now to cultivate means to prepare for the raising of crops or to foster the growth of or, here listen to this one, to improve by labor, care, or study of. Now if you and I want to grow in our love and our obedience to the Lord, then we have to cultivate a heart of obedience. This involves labor. This involves care. This involves the study of God's word. It will take time. It will take effort. Dallas Willard put it best when he wrote, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Now let that sink in a little bit. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is a sense of entitlement. I did this, so I deserve this. But we know that because of we read other parts of Scripture that we have to strive. We have to toil. 
we do our part, God begins to change us through his part. If we never read a lick of God's word, how in the world is he ever going to change us daily like that? And so there is this effort. We can't earn God's grace. It was given to us fully and freely in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't work for God's grace. We work what? From God's grace. Because he's given that to us, we strive to know God's word. We, we toil over and we fight against the sin that battles and easily entangles us. We cultivate our hearts to live in obedience with what God says in his word. So if we want to go in our love and obedience uh, to the Lord, then we have to cultivate a heart of obedience. Now, uh, I want you to see lastly here, we, we, there's this wisdom in obedience where we, uh, we, we, pr- we have this proper motivation, and we cultivate this heart of obedience, and now we see that we have to commit to learning God's Word, that there's a commitment involved here, committing to learn God's Word if we want to grow in our love for, uh, in, in our love and obedience for the Lord. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. So the psalmist, the psalmist here, he has a desire to learn more of God's words for two reasons. Number one, so that he could glorify God. He says, I want to learn your righteous rules. And when I do that, I'm going to praise you with an upright heart. A place of righteousness is what he's talking about. At Psalm 111.2, one of my favorite verses. I actually was going to preach this on May 17th at Baccalaureat Sunday, but I didn't get to. But great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in him. Great are the works of the Lord. Man, do you love the Lord? Well, your reading of the word may show that. Or as you read the word, you begin to delight in the Lord because you begin to see who God really is and how the cross gets bigger and bigger and bigger because your sin gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And God's grace becomes magnificent in your life. The more that we study God's word and we begin to glorify God in this. In fact, the psalmist is not right. He's not studying God's word to impress people. He's not studying God's word so that he can, you know, um, be awesome at uh, uh, Bible trivia, or he's not studying God's Word so that he get this big old church to lead or, or to get on a big stage. He is simply wanting to honor God by listening and studying the Word. And so should we, right? We should. But there's a second. He says that he wants to obey God. That's why he's reading his Word. He's going to keep his statutes. And yet we can't keep God's Word and his commands unless we learn God's commands. So sometimes we just have to start there, just start reading. And Bible reading is difficult sometimes. And then we need to kind of start doing a little bit of study on our own, thinking through it on our own. But as we do that, the other danger is to learn all this stuff, but to learn it in vain because we never actually put it into practice. So we need to also put this into practice. Again, our love for the Lord is measured by our obedience to the Lord, not in a legalistic way, but in a relationship way. Matthew Henry wrote uh, what is probably the best-known commentary on the Bible uh, in English more than 250 years ago. And it was this lifelong work of a man who loved to glorify God through his learning. He, uh, He, as a really, really young boy, he was very sick a lot. But in contrast to his frail frame and body, he was uh, a giant in his intellect and character. By the time he was three, he was reading the Bible. By the time he was nine, he was uh, fluent in Latin and in Greek. Uh, Some of us are a little behind, Clint, so yeah. Uh, He loved to hear his dad preach. He would often uh, hurry to his room and pray that God would seal the word and the spiritual impressions made to his heart so that he might not lose them. Evan, I hope you're paying attention. I expect that that's your prayer. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But unless God leads you to. Um, But God answered those prayers. God answered those prayers. This whole lifelong work is a response of God answering those prayers. In fact, he writes in his commentary on verse 7, where it says, I I will praise you right heart when I learn your righteous rules. He says, as long as we live, uh, we must be scholars in Christ's school and, and sit at his feet. But we should aim to be head scholars. And to get into the highest form. What he means is, look, don't be satisfied with just a little bit of Bible study. 
We, we, are, we are given the grace of God's word. Think about it. Everybody here has at least one copy, probably five copies sitting at home somewhere. Some of us may have even 10 or 15 copies sitting at home somewhere. This is God's grace given to us. It is his revealed word. And we are never to be satisfied with just a little bit of reading, and that's it. This contains life. The very breath of God, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, breathed this into existence, and it is inspired. It is infallible. It is powerful. It changes us from the inside out. So, man, we can't just be satisfied with one 30-minute sermon on a Sunday, can we? No. That, that'd be like eating a meal once a week. And depending on, you know, what I do, it may not be that good of a meal. <laughs> so, I hope it's good. But... You know, we're all human, right? But God's word is given to us to change us from the inside out and to the image of Jesus. And so Matthew Henry's getting at something we need to understand. Don't just, don't just read the word. Man, allow God to continue to change you through this word. Be devoted to it. Be inspired by it. Be, want it more and more and more as a beggar wants bread. Sit at his feet, learn of Christ, grow in Christ. Then our love and obedience for the Lord will be seen by him and by others. God does save us right where we are. But as someone has already said, uh, he refuses to leave us that way. And he wants us to have a proper motivation you know, knowing that his word is there to help us and not harm us. He, he wants us to cultivate a heart of obedience with his help. He wants us to commit to learning his word. And a failure to do these things is a failure uh, uh, of what's best for us. It keeps us from God's best. And I'm not sure if you know this. I'm sure you do. This is just a rhetorical statement. But if there's ever been a time in our world that we need God's best, it's now. <laughs> it is absolutely right now. I have seen, and I'm not going to go into detail about all this stuff, as, as crazy as the world is and all the racial divide, the pandemic, the flag issue and all that, what has been most concerning to me are people who would normally sit in the pew, not saying any of our people, I'm just saying in general, and say things and take stands on things that I don't know if they've ever read a day in their life in this Bible. That's what concerns me, and that's what concerns me for you as your pastor. I don't want you to be there. I want you to think biblically about what's going on. I want you to think gospel-centeredness about what's going on. We all have our opinions, and we all have things that we would like to see happen, but none of that matters ultimately if it doesn't line up with this. I can only imagine if we would all just begin to read God's Word together and devote ourselves to the study of God's word together. I can only imagine what that would look like where 100% of Highland Baptist Church, of those who are saved, who are diligently pursuing God to get through his word. That kind of church would rock the world. I promise you. It started with 12 guys. <laughs> so I know that a church devoted to the word of God will rock the world too. And what this world needs now more than ever are people of faith who are being changed daily by the gospel of Jesus Christ and who are changed in such a way that they are not afraid to live and to love like Jesus in this me-centered and hate-filled world that we live in right now. So I want to ask you, are you going to be part of the solution? Do you want to be part of that solution? I do. And where we begin is we begin to grow in our love and obedience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you at home, maybe even in here, that begins with a brand new relationship. And that, you know, you can't do all this. This is not a behavior modification. You can't turn over a new leaf. This is turning over your life. This is turning over the keys to your heart to the Lord Jesus. That he died for you. He paid for every sin that you have ever committed and ever will commit. And he rose again. And that if you want this kind of forgiveness at work in your life, you want this kind of relationship that he offers to you today, then it's very simple. Admit that you have sin. Believe that Jesus died for you 
and that he rose again, and then commit your way to following his way. Give your heart to him today. If it, the easy way to do that is you can go to our website, www.highlandbaptist.net, and then there's a little button there that says yes to Jesus. That will begin that journey for you. Or if you're, you're in here and you want to make that decision to trust Christ as your Savior today, then uh, we're not going to have a, a typical response down here. Uh, we'll do what we did last week. If you want to make that decision, I'll be down front for a few minutes. Just come down and we'll, we'll social distance six feet away and we'll talk about and uh, be able to walk through that together. And then some of you just may need a renewed relationship with the Lord. Maybe your Bible reading is slacked a little bit. Maybe uh, you, and it's not just about the Bible reading, guys. It's the heart behind it. Maybe you don't even have the desire right now to read the Word. Look, I've been there. A lot of us have been there. We start with a renewed relationship. We ask the Lord, Lord, give me that passion. Give me that desire. Help me to want to open my Bible instead of go to something else, Lord. And he will. If you are serious about that prayer, he'll begin that work that, or renew that work in you. So maybe that's where you need to start. And then some of you may just need a, a new church family to walk through all this together with. Um, in fact, we had a, a wonderful couple last week that joined uh, after we came down. So if that's what you need to do and God's calling you here, then don't delay. Be obedient to what he's calling you to do today. Um, and I'll be down front after uh, the service to be able to talk with you. Well, however God decides to work and, and move in our midst, may we honor him with our love and our obedience. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the wonderful time in your word that you've given to us. God, you're so good to us. And we, we ask that, God, you would take our hearts and that you would bend them and mold them to you and to what Jesus is doing in our life and wants to do in our life. God, that you would use us in this world to be people of uh, the gospel, to be people of your light, to be unifying um, uh, around what you have said in your word and what the gospel does in all of us, Lord. God, and that we would be people that really do treat the cross as level ground. God, we thank you that you have had mercy on us. God, help us to be people of mercy and grace as we leave in just a few moments, God. Thank you we come to your word and look at your word and be able to, to, uh, to join with the psalmist and, and say that, God, that you have given us so many blessings and we can praise you no matter what the circumstance is because you are good and you are on your throne and you are at work. So we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we continue worship with 10,000 Reasons.
Thank you. You may be seated. Hey. <laughs> Me again. Hello. Um, so, like Abby said, I'm going to be talking about VBS. Um, I'm so excited about VBS this summer. Um, so, VBS is going to be online, and I'm super pumped about it. I was, I've been wearing um, construction vest around because the theme is con concrete and cranes. So I walked in David's office the other day, and he said, why are you always dressed up? Because I had a construction hat and um, a, a safety vest on, and I've been doing all the motions going out to eat with Brandon, and Brandon's like embarrassed. But I'm so super excited for VBS this summer. Um, like I said, the theme is concrete and cranes, and the theme verse is Philippians uh, chapter 1 verse 6. Let me read it. I, um, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it out unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so our motto this year is um, Jesus, our strong foundation. So we're going to be talking about all about how Jesus is our strong foundation. Um, we're going to be talking about how he's our foundation of love, our foundation of forgiveness, our foundation of worth. Uh, promise and of um, and for life. So we're going to be talking about all about how Jesus is our strong foundation. And VBS is going to be completely online this summer, um, which kind of stinks because it's my first VBS here. But I'm still super excited about it. It's still going to be lots of fun. Um, so some things that you need to know: VBS is July 13th through the 17th. Okay, so that's in two or, two or three weeks, something like that. So um, be sure to sign up for it. Um, I still need you to register for VBS because we're going to have a um, supply pickup day on. July 12th. That's the Sunday before VBS starts. So um, um, you can sign up for VBS through Shelby Next. I'll be sharing all these um, links onto the Highland Baptist um, Facebook page. And um, a lot of questions that I've been getting is, I'm going to be busy that week. Are the videos still going to be up? Yes. If you're out of town that week of VBS, um, that I'm going to be posting everything, the videos are still going to be up so you can still participate in VBS whenever like the week later or two weeks later. So um, the videos will still be up and all the videos that will, the things that will be included are a worship rally, Bible study, music, and a crafts demonstration. So all the parents really have to do is to help with crafts and help them concentrate and um, maybe even do uh, snacks and some recreation games if y'all want to. So um, and volunteers are still needed because we're doing it online. I'm gonna be needing some hype um, motion doers you know, doing some dances and um, some skits and um, some Bible study, help me with Bible study and craft. So I'm super excited about it. And yeah, I'll see y'all at VBS. Adults are welcome. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I can't follow that. <laughs> uh, so parents, if you are at home right now, then as soon as we're done, Please don't put that off. Go register for VBS. Most of you have the link already. You just haven't entered yet. So go ahead and do that. As soon as we're done, then uh, flip over and start uh, registering for that. Hey, uh, real quick before we're done, um, we go to a new schedule next week, um, and that is uh, where we go through. Uh, you're going to get to come, uh, thankfully, we're slowly getting there, uh, every other week. And so A through J, um, if your last name, that's not you guys, but you uh, in the at home out there. A through J, uh, yours is the first and third Sundays. Uh, this would include you guys. Um, K through Z, the second and fourth Sunday. Um, we do still encourage you uh, to do mask and social distancing, especially since we're getting more people into the building as we continue to uh, uh, get uh, closer to what it looks like a little bit more normal. Um, and so help us to do that if you would. Uh, in, in line with that, um, your staff is going to be meeting this week and trying to come up with a, 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 a more of a phase two approach. Uh, and, you know, we're starting that process on uh, uh, this week. So be praying for us and what that's going to look like as we move through Ju uh, July. Um, and you'll start seeing more opportunities uh, be able to open up um to be able to be in the building and things like that. And also be praying for our country and our, uh, our, our state um, and all the leaders in between. Um, you know, we just live in a crazy world right now and there's lots of wisdom that is needed and uh, lots of a gospel witness that is needed. So let's be that uh, gospel witness um, as we go out in just a few moments. One, one scripture that I want you to leave with this morning is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. We talked about the value of God's Word today and why we need to get into it. And, and we even mentioned that all of God's Word is either leading up to Jesus or lived out from Jesus. 
Paul knew that. In, in fact, in verse uh, 20 of chapter uh, 1 in 2 Corinthians, he said, For all of God's promises find their yes in Christ. All of God's promises. There are 3,000 promises in the Bible that God has said yes to, and Jesus has paid for with his very blood. Now, you can think about those promises as gift cards. Did you know that uh, every year 5.8 billion gift cards are, uh, are left unclaimed? Um, somebody's paid for them, just not, un- not claimed them. There are 3,000 promises in this Bible that are given to us that are left unclaimed unless we go to God's Word and we get them through Christ there. Have an awesome, a wonderful week. We love you. God bless. We'll see you next time. You're dismissed.